161. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 to 19. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace towards me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it, it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. Susie, thank you very much for reading. Please do keep that um, passage of the Bible open and you may find it helpful to have access to that um, outline. What is at the heart of the gospel we believe? That is the question we're considering this morning. What is at the heart of the gospel we believe, the one we preach here at St. Nick's, the one we teach on Sunday mornings. I've brought with me up to the front a copy of my um, favourite gospel outline, the one I learnt as a student. It's a little outline called Two Ways to Live, and it's basically a summary. It's a six-box gospel outline that presents you with, unsurprisingly, the um, two ways that you can live. And you'll see I've put a little summary of it down there on the handout. Box one, God is our creator. Okay, he is our maker, he's our ruler. He made us under rulers in his world. He made us to um, be rulers of the world under him. Box two, we reject the ruler. We reject our good creator. We've turned from him and as a consequence, we have mucked up his world. And, and can't you see that in the world around us? God will act in judgment. That's Box three, God the loving ruler won't let evil go unpunished in his world. We should face his wrath forever. We should die because we're sinners. We, we should be punished for what we've done in the world. Here's the good bit, box four. Jesus is our saviour. God's a very loving ruler and he sent his only son to save the world. Jesus... So we've been thinking about this weekend, suffered on a cross for us. Despite not doing evil, Jesus, box four, offers full forgiveness to the world. And um, he was resurrected, box five, raised up by his father, as we've been thinking about already. He now sits enthroned as king over the, the um, world. And so, box six, the question, in the light of coming judgment, how will you respond to him who is king over the world. How are you going to respond to Jesus? There are, as you can see, 
two ways to live. Now, it's a helpful gospel outline, okay? We learned it when we were students. When I was a student worker, I um, taught it to others. And it's just really attempting to be a summary. And it is a very good summary of some central points of God's word. But here's the question. What would be the box you'd say would make or break the gospel? You know, of those six, which box could you leave out? Um, Which one is central to God's word? Well, think of it like Jenga, okay? You've been wondering what this illustration is about. Think of it like Jenga. If the gospel were like Jenga, what is the corner block? What sort of um, supports the rest of the gospel word? What block supports the tower? What event has such importance that it makes or breaks the gospel, the gospel word? Now, this morning, we're beginning a short series in this chapter, 1 Corinthians 15, as we've heard. It's a chapter all about the implications of the gospel, both for us as Christian people and for the world. So it is about, verse 12, our resurrection, the resurrection of the dead. It's about our destiny as Jesus' people and as a world. It's about the implications of what we believe, the gospel, what it means to live a fruitful life in this world. And um, I want to say at the start that I'm really excited about this series. Okay, I suggested it, so um, if it doesn't work, the blame is solely attached to me. It's new material, and um, you're going to have to bear with us because it's difficult. But um, do you ever feel like following Jesus might not be worth it? You know, the relationship that I have to deny myself, it's just not worth it my unfulfilled potential, that promotion I didn't take at work, is it worth it, suffering for Jesus? Do do you ever feel it's not worth the shame of speaking about Jesus? The shame in the office, or or the shame at work? Well, we're going to see over these next four weeks that in the Lord, your faith and your labor is not in vain. It's what we've called the series. It is not in vain. And I think it's going to be a great few weeks together, so I do hope that you'll come back. And yet as we start this series, Paul reminds us, very simply, of the gospel. He reminds us of the message that we've heard before the implications of the gospel. Paul reminds us of the gospel. And you might well have thought, verse 1, that it's all stuff that you've heard already. So verse 1, now... I would remind you, brothers, says Paul, of the gospel that I preached to you, which you received and by which you are being saved. Verse 3, for I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. So far, so good, you might think. I'm sure I know the gospel. I agree with all the stuff that I have heard. I could have told you that already, Tom. I know I need salvation. And I know that Jesus died, verse 3, to take away the sins of the world. After all, we've just had a whole weekend on it, have we not? Jesus died to take away the sins of the world. And yet here's the test, verse 14. If you really know the gospel... If you really have thought through what you have heard, you'll know that Jesus being raised is central to the gospel. In fact, that is the thing that makes or breaks the message we've heard. Verse 14, if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. The resurrection... The resurrection of Jesus is the centre of the gospel that we've heard. And I'll put you out of your misery at this point. If you take away Easter Sunday, (laughs) the whole thing comes tumbling down. That is the thing that we're going to think about this morning. And um, I want us this morning to just think, for that reason, about the gospel, okay? I want us to think just in a slightly different way about the message that we have heard. And I want to encourage us to hold fast to Paul's gospel. 
a gospel of a crucified and resurrected Jesus. And the resurrection is right at the heart of that gospel word. So two points on the handout. You'll see I've given it the title, Why Easter is the Heart of the Gospel. Here's point one. If Christ wasn't raised, dead people aren't raised. And I'm looking at verses 12 to 15. Verse 12. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there's no resurrection of the dead? But if there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. The reason that for Paul, this is the center of the gospel, Easter Sunday, is the gospel word requires resurrection. A gospel that is saving us, verse 2, requires a resurrection, people raised to life again on a future day. I think that's what Paul means when he speaks of the resurrection, verse 12, verse 13, the resurrection of the dead. That is a day fixed in the future when we will be resurrected. We will come to life again. We will be raised. Just been singing about it, haven't we? Christ in power resurrected as we will be when he comes. But just note in his mind how this is tied up first to Jesus. Did you see that? We won't come to life, says Paul, if he is in the grave. It's tied, in fact, we might say organically, to Easter Sunday. Jesus, being raised to life, means we too will be raised. Verse 12 again. If Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there's no resurrection from the dead? If there's no resurrection of the dead, verse 13, then not even Christ has been raised. Now, I want us to think some more next week, okay, about the link between these two things. So um, just, um, if you can hold off for a week, we'll come back to it in verse 20 next week. But just note for now that Jesus being raised is central to the gospel because it means our resurrection It means that we will be raised to life. We will come out of our graves. It's interesting, we were were chatting about this earlier, but um, Christianity Explored, you ask people, what does the resurrection prove about Jesus? And they say, the resurrection proves Jesus was God. Paul says, what does the resurrection prove about Jesus? The resurrection proves that he was a man. Because being raised is what happens if you're a man. So we'll come back to that next week. Now, you don't need me to tell you this, but without a resurrection, Christian hope is void. The winner is the grave. Without a resurrection, there can be no final judgment, no eternal life, on the other hand. Once you are dead, you are dead. And our Christian hope is built around that final resurrection. We are people looking forward to the day. We're people being saved, verse 2, from fiery final judgment. We are children, Paul says elsewhere, of the day. And what is more, it's knowledge that there is a resurrection which induces transformation here today. I wonder if you've ever thought about that. Um, it's an interesting point, isn't it? I'm not sure I've really thought about it that much myself. I've certainly not taught it very well before. But um, Paul has lots to say in 1 Corinthians about the day. Um, Just turn back in your Bibles, back to um, chapter 5 of 1 Corinthians. This is time 3 of 5 that Paul mentions the day, that resurrection day, the day we're going to be raised. And um, just note what he does with it, okay? Okay. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. It is actually reported, writes Paul, that there is sexual immorality among you, among the Corinthian church, and of a kind that's not tolerated even among pagans, for a man has his father's wife, and you are arrogant. 
Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. Verse 4, when you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is present with the power of the Lord Jesus, take it when you're gathered on a Sunday like this, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of his flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Okay, now gloss over the details for the moment of this story, but just notice how Paul uses the day of the Lord. Verse 5, it's an incentive to repent of what's ungodly, to return, repent, to come back to the Lord. That day, in fact, is the incentive to flee sin, to do what is godly. Resurrection means I must live now for the Lord. Can you just begin to see why Jesus' resurrection is the block on which the whole thing stands or falls? Without it, it is useless. It has verse 14, back in chapter 15, no substance. Literally, it is of no value at all. It all falls. It often has been quoted, even um, from the front at St. Nick's, that of Church of England clergy, 33% think Jesus never rose. And um, I should say at this point that I found these verses difficult this week. And Emily tells me that when I find something difficult, I always have a go at the Church of England. Okay? So you need to weigh this and work out whether you think this is a a fair analogy, but I'm going to say it anyway. Okay? It often has been quoted... That of Church of England clergy, 33% think Jesus never rose. And I did a a Google search this week to try and find that survey. It was taken nearly 20 years ago. I don't know what your average clergyman thinks now. But it got me thinking, might it be the slide in ethics of this nation's clergy is because they don't think Jesus really rose? Because they don't think judgment is a real threat? or a reality. I'll only rise, remember, if Jesus himself rose. I mean, why would I deny myself some sexual fulfillment if I don't think that Jesus really rose? I'm only going to live once. Why would I look foolish and proclaim a Christian gospel that is conservative on ethics or on moral code. I mean, that would get me banned from the Today program. Why would I want to do that? Oh, the Christian person, they can do those things because they're waiting for heaven. Resurrection day. Because Jesus really did rise. If there's no resurrection, then you only live once. Heaven, satisfaction, can only be found on earth. Which leads us on quite nicely to point two down on the handout. If Christ wasn't raised, we really have no hope. Verse 12 again, now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there's no resurrection of the dead? But if there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ was raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ. But verse 17, look down, verse 17. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. Verse 19 is um, the point I made, I think, regarding bishops. Take away the resurrection. There is no hope. As Christians, we look, don't we, pitiful, denying ourselves, taking up our cross and following Jesus. As Christians, we look pitiful. If there's no resurrection, we need other people's sympathy. We're never going to cope. Totally tragic. But just look at verse 17, okay? The offer of the gospel, sins forgiven, saving faith, a living hope. 
Without the resurrection, it is a nonsense, all of that gospel. Without Jesus raised, we don't have any hope. Verse 17, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Um, We touched on this, I think, with Ben, actually, in our third um, session yesterday morning. But for Christ to free me from my sins requires his resurrection. For as long as Jesus is dead, I have no hope. Without him being raised again, there's no justification. I cannot be saved. I will die without hope. Various different ways of illustrating this. So um, at Christianity Explored, we, we'd say something like this. Um, the prisoner who walks free at the end of his jail sentence walks free because he has paid in full the punishment. Okay, he's, um, the, the full sort of demands of the law court have been met as he walks free from prison. And we'd say that with Jesus, the wages of sin is death. That is what we deserve. And so when Jesus rises again and is freed from the grave, we know that he has paid the wages in full, okay? We'd say something like that. Let me try and use the illustration of the chapter, though. And um, I think we've got a picture that's about to come up on um, the slide behind me. Okay, so think of sin as like the sting of an Egyptian scorpion. Okay, it's sting in its great... Sorry, I don't know what that is. That's sort of... (laughs) Uh, its sting is in its great tail, okay? If you could picture that, its sting is in its great tail. And think of death as using sin, just like that great big scorpion. The sting of death is sin. Okay, that is what Paul shows. But in his resurrection, Christ defeated death. The scorpion, he he came to life again, as everybody knows. He crushed his head. That scorpion can no longer sting the one in Jesus. When I die in Christ, as a Christian, I won't just decompose, okay? Death has lost its sting. One day, I will come to life again. Thanks, Connor. A resurrected Jesus is the center of the gospel because without a risen Jesus, there is no hope. In death, he bore our sins for us. But it's his resurrection which proves we have a lasting and substantial hope. To come back to where we began with this little gospel outline, two ways to live, which I used to teach to all the students. Um, It's interesting, the writers of this outline of the gospel have recently changed the box in which they put our hope. So they've just this year, in fact, refreshed this little um, two ways to live outline, and they have made the decision to change the box in which they put our hope. So when I learned it, and as I outlined it to you earlier, it was all about box four, okay? So box four, went like this, because of his great love for us, God sent his son into the world. Jesus always lived under God's rule, yet by dying in our place, he took our punishment and brought forgiveness. Do you see, it's all about box four. It's all about the cross. But recently, they've moved it. In light of, I take it, verses like this, it is a resurrected saviour that brings hope. Without the resurrection... I am still in my sins. Easter Sunday is our grounds for hope. So as we close, let me ask, do you really know the gospel? Do you really know the basis of our hope? Have you thought through the gospel? Next week, we'll do the implications. But for now, have you thought through our gospel hope. If I'm being honest, in my knowledge of the gospel, I am weak on how verse 4 gives us much hope. Verse 4, he was buried, 
raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. I'm better on verse 3, of course. I know the Christian gospel is about the cross, and that can give us hope. Just had a weekend away on that. But just perhaps your gospel, like mine, weak on resurrection. Do you really know why Easter gives us hope? Paul says if you take box five from out this gospel outline, it is obvious that box four didn't work. In fact, you take out box five, and it's obvious that box three and box six, in fact, are based on a false hope, the resurrection of the dead. There's not going to be a judgment. It doesn't matter how you live your life now. You're just going to die and rot. A world in which box two can happen without intervention could not be created by the God we know. Boxes one to four are based on five. Oh, Jesus resurrection is the center of our saving gospel words. So do you know the gospel? Do you trust the resurrection? Do you trust this central building block of God's word? If so, hold fast to Jesus. As we'll see, his resurrection, it should make a difference now and give us hope. Let me pray. Our Father, we thank you so much for reminding us this morning of the gospel, for reminding us that Jesus Christ is our living and reigning hope. And we pray you'd help us think deeply about it and to trust it. This awesome gospel, Christ first died, then he was resurrected, and he offers real living hope. And um, help us to believe the gospel you have revealed to us. Grant us confidence in it, grow our understanding of it, and so deepen our hope, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.